Hello, everyone. We're going to get started in about two more minutes. Um, we had a good number of people uh, signed up, and we want to give them a chance um, to uh, dial in or log in. So we'll give them a couple more minutes, and then we will certainly go ahead and get started. Thank you for your patience. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon uh, to everyone. We want to welcome you to today's very important webinar entitled Native American Cultural Practices for Youth Mentoring, Lessons from the Field. My name is Brian Sales, and I serve as the Director of Training and Technical Assistance at Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership, and uh, under the auspices and support of the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, we are the TA provider for the National Mentoring Resource Center, and we are extremely uh, pleased and excited uh, to provide this audience of OJJDP grantees and others an opportunity to hear and learn from practice-based experts on this very important topic. The goal of today's webinar, our panelists will provide our audience with an overview of organizational, cultural, and programmatic experiences working with Native American youth and families. Additionally, our panelists will discuss specific approaches when working in American Indian communities that can be helpful, especially for non-Native organizations. Lastly, our presenters will answer questions from the audience that will be moderated by myself and Melissa Seidenberg and Jennifer Burgoyne of Mentor. Uh, we're, again, we're very pleased to have folks, and it looks like we have people from all around uh, we have organizations 
from National 4-H. Looks like on the call, big brothers, big sisters, boys and girls clubs, uh, see my alma mater, Cornell University, and from other uh, organizations uh, that are very interested in this particular topic. If we can go and move to the next slide. So, um, good to know. Uh, Melissa, are you able and ready to, do you, to go through this slide for us? Sure. This is just a good to know kind of just a reminder that one week after the webinar, at, at the very most, all attendees will receive an email with instructions for how to access the PDF presentation slides and webinar recording. Um, links to the National Mentoring Resource Center web page where the OGJDP grantees can log on to view it as well there. And it will also be located on OJJDP's NTAC online university. And at the end of this webinar, we're looking to collect a little bit of survey information. So if you don't mind, just take a few minutes. It actually shouldn't even take more than two to fill out the survey once the webinar closes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa. So I see some other folks have joined uh, from the YMCA and some of the other national organizations. So today, all attendees will be muted for best sound. Uh, we want you to type questions and comments in the question box, which you can see there. And um, we will keep you on mute. Again, we've got a, a sizable panelist, uh, a group of panelists here, so I won't spend a lot of time talking. But we'll open things up right now with a poll. Talk to us or let us know about your experience working with Native populations. Please select one, highly experienced, experience, some experience, or no experience. Take a few moments to do that, and we will get back with you. Okay, great. It looks as though we have a few experts here, 19% that are highly experienced, 28% experienced, and 44% with some experience, and then 9% with no experience at all. So it looks like we, that's pretty typical of our uh, webinars that we do at Mentor. We have kind of crossed the gamut here in terms of people's experiences working in the particular populations. Um, we'll go on to the next slide. Okay, so we have a very distinguished panel here. We hope that um, you all are very uh, enthusiastic as we are um, getting to hear from some of our experts here. First, we have Carla Knapp. She's the National Director of Native Services, uh, the Native Services Unit, excuse me, from the Boys and Girls Club of America. And we also have practitioner expert, Dr. Rose Marie Lowry Townsend. She is the CEO of the Boys and Girls Club of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina. And we have nationally recognized expert Lamont Yavi, Director of Educational Services of the Navajo Head Start. Uh, we have Braden White, who will be our youth voice today. He is a recipient of the 2016 Champion for Change. And then last, of course, but not least, Josie Rafaelito from the Center for Native American Youth, who serves as a program manager. All right, next slide. So what I'd like to do now, instead of listening to me talk, I want to turn it over to Carla Knapp, and she will share a little bit about um, the overview for Boys and Girls Club, a brief introduction of herself, tribal affiliation, and her current role. Carla. Thank you, Brian. So as Brian mentioned, I'm the National Director of Native Services for Boys and Girls Clubs of America, but I'm also pr a proud tribal member of the Penobscot um, Indian Nation. So um, I've been working with Boys and Girls Clubs for over 16 years now. Next slide. Boys and Girls Club of America charted its first club in Indian Country in 1992. And today, 24 years later, Boys and Girls Clubs in Indian Country is a true success story. We are the nation's largest native youth serving agency with 174 clubs serving over 87,000 youth in 25 states representing 90 different American Indian, Alaskan Native, and Hawaiian communities. Next slide, please. So this map reflects the number of the tribes that we partner with and the number of Boys and Girls Club sites across the country. Um, in addition, we're proud to say that we've expanded our services to help 
um, our Bureau of Indian Education, BIE dorms or residential halls, um, and we are piloting Boys and Girls Club programs. So next slide. And with the support from the U.S. Department of Justice, Boys and Girls Clubs of America since 2008 has successfully matched nearly 60,000 youth on native lands through the mentoring program. Next slide. And the OJP grant money for mentoring comes at a time when research confirms the importance of positive adult role models. Our mentoring programs consist of one hour per week, along with group mentoring and evidence-based programs. Next slide. So why is mentoring important for Native youth? Native American youth are at most of risk than any other population or ethnic group in this country. More than one in three Native youth live in poverty. Only 68% of Native youth graduate from high school. Rates of diabetes are higher than the general population, and Native American suicide rates are two and a half times the national average, and Native teens experience the highest rate of suicide of any population group in the United States. In fact, suicide is the second leading cause of death for Native American youth um, between the ages of 15 and 24. Native youth ages 12 and older report using alcohol and teen pregnancy is a concern for Native American girls between the ages of 15 and 19 report having a child. And the most startling statistic is that Native Americans are twice as likely to die before the age of 24 than any other race. And things that we don't often talk about is that one in every three Native American women report being raped or subjected to attempted rape. And the murder rate of Native American women is 10 times higher than the national murder rate. That's why mentoring programs are so important to have positive role models for our Native youth. And it looks like you already moved to the next slide. Um, th so through mentoring in Indian country, currently there are 155 mentoring sites in 22 states, and our Boys and Girls Clubs in Indian country have successfully matched 2,873 youth within the first three months of the project period. Next slide. All of our youth are mentored. Um, they complete a full program cycle of approved evidence-based programs, two of which are Boys and Girls Clubs of America's national evidence-based programs, Project Learn and Smart Leaders. They all on positive action. Next slide. So Project Learn is a curriculum that reinforces and enhances the skills and knowledge that our young people learn at school during the hours they spend at the club. This strategy consists of five components, homework, health, and tutoring, high-yield learning activities, parental involvement, school collaborations, and incentives. Next slide. Smart Leaders, re smart leaders reinforces skills, knowledge, youth learned, and smart moves, and prepares teens as leaders to help their peers resist using alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, as well as postpone sexual activity. Next slide. Positive action. It teaches positive actions in the physical, intellectual, social, and emotional areas in a fun and easy way to improve academic behavior, college and career readiness, mental and physical health, social emotional learning, and positive action content is taught through six units. Next slide, please. During the first quarter of our program project in 2016, 23% of youth mentored have exhibited an increase in grade point average, and 51% of youth mentored have exhibited an increase in school attendance. Next slide. So recruiting mentees. Identifying the mentees is the easiest part for our boys and girls clubs. Our boys and girls clubs are facility-based. Our clubs have a high rate of average daily attendance. They're open five days a week and four hours after school. So identifying the mentee is the easiest part because our boys and girls clubs have the youth. And the next slide is recruiting mentors. So now where do you begin identifying mentors who are positive role models for our native youth? You can recruit them from tribal employees, tribal elders, community members, staff, 
club and alumni, but you're going to hear more from Lamont Yazzie shortly, some best practices as well as lessons learned in recruiting mentors. Next slide. So now recruiting mentors through partnerships. So what are some of the best practices recruiting through memberships, whether it's universities, local businesses, your tribal police department and fire department, or other tribal departments such as your Indian Health Services or schools um, on the reservation. But again, you'll hear more from Lamont um, on best practices and lessons learned. So the next slide. So it is an honor to introduce Dr. Rosemarie Lowry Townsend, who, will start, um, who started Alumni Boys and Girls Club as the CEO and Tribal Manager of Youth Services in 2014. Prior to that, she spent 35 years in the field of education as a teacher, then principal, and finally as the superintendent of school to today where she is the chief executive officer of the Alumni Boys and Girls Club. So um, Rose, um, I will let her talk about her mentoring program and some of her best practices in incorporating cultural components. Good afternoon. The Lumbee Tribes of North Carolina's Boys and Girls Club are mentoring our native youth cult through culturally enriched activities that enco encourage them to become self-sufficient, educated, responsible, and caring citizens. Next slide. We feel there are two important components of mentoring at our clubs. They are number one, the relationship between a caring adult and the members being mentored, and number two, including cultural relevance to instill pride in our youth about ourselves and our heritage. Some examples include, number one, having a mentoring staff member whose job focuses on cultural programming. Number two, inviting elders into the club to bead and quilt. Number three, creating a garden. And number four, mentoring for academic success. Next slide. Members are engaged in the nurturing of Mother Earth to help create a taste of Lumbee culture and connecting our members to the land. Youth and elders come together in this joint venture, strengthening generational bonds that create lifelong relationships and commitment for seven generations. Each generation is responsible to teach, learn, and protect the three generations that have come before them, their own and the next three. Thus, we revere the seven generations we are most immediately connected to, our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, ourselves and our siblings, our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. Next slide. Food has always been the center of our family, church, and tribal celebrations. Mentoring is a long-term commitment. Through our taste of Lumbee culture, both mentors and mentees are investing, nurturing, and being rewarded. Next slide. Investment. Give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach him how to fish, and he'll eat for a lifetime. We teach our youth about gardening and canning foods, resulting into healthy eating habits. Next slide. Nurturing. A member waters her garden on a hot summer day. Next slide. Reward of self-sufficiency. A garden is a teacher. It teaches patience as we begin with a small seed and watch as the seed grows and bears fruit. A garden is a friend that is at any time. Next slide. Mentors also focus on education, a means to fulfill dreams. During our annual Deep in My Heart, I Promise to Graduate celebration, members sign heart pledge cards at a Valentine's dinner and dance. Next slide. Strong family ties are central to strong Native communities. 
Mentoring our youth to become part of a healthy family relationship means everyone has responsibilities. Next slide. Teamwork results in fresh strawberries and a cake ready for topping. Some members of the club gathered the strawberries while others stayed back and prepared the cake. That would result in our strawberry shortcake. Next slide. Creating a home for a family means everyone participates in all duties. Members have different duties to perform during scheduled activities. Next slide. Through our tribal gardening program, our members like the food we are growing are learning to respect, encourage, and care for each other and our communities. Next slide. The next couple of uh, slides, you will see our members participating in community service work. In this first one, encouraged by mentors to volunteer, members help at a local food pantry, living the adage, we make a living by what we give, but we make a life by what we give. Next slide. Community involvement creates loving, caring, and sharing future citizens and leaders. This slide shows our members' involvement in Red Nose Day. Day. Members collected and gave out over 200 boxes of food to low-income families with children. Next slide. In this slide, members recognize the many volunteer hours of a local volunteer fire department. Members recognize fire departments, police departments, county sheriff offices, rescue squads, ambulance services, and highway patrol offices in three different counties with 45 gift boxes. Activities like this demonstrate commitment to the mentoring of our youth to become respected and caring citizens, tenants of our Lumbee heritage and culture. Next slide. Creating pride and self-worth self -worth grounded in our heritage and identity prepares our youth for great futures. In the first picture, our youth are involved in a cultural sports activity. In the second picture, this was taken during our weekly cultural classes. Here, our youth connect with God where the drum represents the heartbeat of Mother Earth and all Indian people, people. The third picture was taken during our annual youth powwow. During our youth powwows, only club members participate as dancers, drummers, and singers. Thank you. Well, thank you both very much. We really appreciate it. I'm going to turn things over to Jennifer Burgoyne, and if there are questions at this time, please uh, type them if you have not into the chat box. Jennifer? Hi, yeah, thank you both for that great information. We have one attendee here who has Native youth in her program, but doesn't have enough Native American mentors to match with these young people. Do you match all Native youth in your program with a Native American mentor? And how important do you think this is for these programs that are having some difficulty with recruitment? Uh, so let's start that with Carla. Okay, so for our boys and girls clubs on native lands that are running the OJP mentoring program, it's a requirement that they must match a minimum of 20 native youth at their clubs. Um, it's not limited to, but they, the goal is to match a minimum of 20. And what was the second half of her question? How important do you think this is to have a match of a native youth with a Native American mentor? Is that, have you found in, in your time that that's been significant or important? I think it depends on knowing each child that you're serving through your organization. I think having positive Native role models for our Native youth help um, bring um, self-identity, 
um, self-awareness, and I think culture is really important to our youth to have that sense of pride. Um, but I've also seen where their mentor has been a, nat a non-native person and works just as well. Those relationships and the bond that they build and when a youth needs to share something, they feel connected with somebody, um, that's what's important at the end of the day, that they have someone that they trust and feel comfortable in going to. I mean, I've seen it work both ways and I've seen pros and cons, whether it's the right fit or it's not. Great, thank you so much. And we have another question here. Um, if we have time, Brian, for, for Rosemary. Please, please. Yeah. Go right ahead. Okay, so we have some questions about your model. Um, we're wondering if the mentors in your program are staff or volunteers, and if you could talk a little bit more about the model, if it's one-on-one -on -one or group activities. Our mentors are paid mentors. Uh, we have a combination outside of them that are volunteers. One of the things that we've been uh, doing here is that we have had all of our staff participate in some mentoring training that has been offered uh, by Boys and Girls Club because we feel that it was so effective with the 20 that we have that it would also be effective with the other students or members that we have uh, in our club. Now, what we've done there, we've been able to expand it with uh, our university. We have a university that is within five miles of one of our clubs. So we've been able to use individuals from there. Uh, our elders have been really good about also acting as mentors uh, for our students. Uh, we think that just a whole program of mentoring is very effective. Now, because um, we have non-native students in our club, our paid mentors are American Indians. They are all Lumbee uh, members of the tribe. But we mentor non-native uh, um, members. And that's where the sensitivity to understanding and becoming um, you know, trusted by our members, that becomes the, the key to um, being able to be uh, or to offer effective mentoring um, to any of the members that's part of our club. Thank you. And lastly, could you, uh, Rosemary, could you talk a little bit about the enrollment process for your mentors, or for and and I guess staff are, are doing some mentoring too, um, and what the training looks like? Uh, well, we do the national training that's um uh, recognized that is uh, offered to our paid mentors. We use them. Uh, we use that same training uh, for them as well. And one of the recruitment pieces, like I said, we go to our elders group. We have organized elders groups at all of our sites that also use the facilities that we have. So they are there for us to go in. One of the big things this summer that we, we went back to them and asked them to do was to come on board with us and help us uh, work with the kids on Quilton, uh, work with the kids on Cannon because uh, so much of the generation, the present generation, uh, does not can. So uh, usually if we send out something um, across social media, you know, we make visitations to where we know there's going to be elders, um, you know, we can recruit from that. But then the, the side itself of having a university here and students needing to do volunteer hours, needing to do uh, internships, uh, that's part of requirements uh, for um, their class or just resume building. That has been a good um, piece for us to be able to find additional mentors uh, beyond the ones that we are paying. Great, thank you. And the la I think the last follow-up I have on, on that line of questions is: um, Are your do the matches work in large groups, small groups, or a one-to-one? -one? We do all of the above. We have some kids, particularly with academic issues. It may require one-on-one, um, -on -one, and sometimes it's uh, the majority of the time, to be honest with you, it's beyond what we call the required activity uh, for our mentors, and uh, that's where it comes into play. Our mentors truly get to know the needs of our mentees. So we do group activities with them. You may find a group that's split up of you know, five kids, 
But then when you look at our clubs as a whole, we can do large group activities because we want to see, one of the things we do particularly on Friday is to break down into small groups and have this one mentor, which is a regular staff person, that works with that small group and plans individualized things just for their group. They've surveyed the kids, they found out their weaknesses, they found out their strengths, they, they know about what they like and what they dislike. So they can individualize an activity just for their small group. They may decide that they're carrying their kids um, skating, they may go to a movie, any of those little things that they want to do to get to know them better or get to reward them for something that they have done. So you will find Mentoring being done individually, tailored just for that child, maybe groups of five, it may be groups of ten. What we try to do, unless a couple combines, we try never to move beyond maybe 20 to 25 in some of those larger groups. Great. Perfect, thank you. I think that's all the time we have for questions now, but we have a couple other Q&A sessions a little later in the webinar, so please keep those questions coming. and. We'll try to get to these other questions soon. Okay, well, thank you both. I uh, really appreciate the uh, overview. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Dr. Lamont Yazi from the Navajo Nation, uh, who currently serves as the Director of Educational Services for the Navajo Head Start Program within the Department of Dean Education in Window Rock, Arizona. Uh, he serves as a member of the faculty at the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College at Arizona State. Uh, his research is at the intersection of education, American Indian language revitalization, and school readiness. Specifically, he looks at the policy context of language and literacy development in Western institutional education and its impacts on American Indian. His current research examines early childhood education reforms and how these reforms have encouraged and supported language shifts in preschool education. And Lamont uh, played a very pivotal role in the rollout of the mentoring um, of children of incarcerated uh, parents, which he'll talk a lot about. So we we're very, very happy to have Dr. Lamont Yadi. He's a very busy man and uh, just very happy to have him. So Lamont, I'm going to turn things over to you. Great. Thank you for that introduction. Um, just to start out, I want to, I want to give some preface. In August of 2004, Tommy Thompson, the former Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, came to the Navajo Nation and announced that the Navajo Nation was selected to develop and implement our proposed National Native American Mentoring Program. And so uh, the Navajo Nation had partnered with boys and girls clubs throughout Indian country in developing a plan to specifically address the issues of Native American children whose parents are incorporated, incarcerated. Next slide, please. And so building on the strong network of boys and girls clubs in Indian country, the Navajo Nation teamed up with boys and girls clubs to establish and enhance the National Native American Mentoring Program. And so this program uh, was grounded in each club's philosophy of positive youth development, organizational infrastructure, and appropriate uh, personnel designated to coordinate and super supervise such a mentoring program. And so we did initially get awarded for three years in 2007, and then we got re-awarded for 2010 uh, for a total of 600 matches uh, across the six-year time period. Uh, the project was, again, unique because uh, we targeted those children um, whose parents were incarcerated in a tribal, state, or federal prisons. And the premise behind identifying children of incarcerated parents it was in, through a congressional report that identified that children of incarcerated parents were seven times more likely to, to become part of the system itself. Next slide, please. And so this is an overview of data that we utilized um, in looking at uh, an overview of the situation in local jails in Indian country. And according to the U.S. Department of Justice's Bureau of Justice Statistics, um, on June 30, 2004, a total of 68 jails, confinement facilities, detention centers, and other correctional facilities were supervising uh, 1,745 persons in Indian country. And so this just kind of gave us an idea in terms of we're uh, looking at the jails in Indian country, looking at the 
the highest uh, frequency numbers of American Indians within those facilities, we were able to develop our targets in terms of uh, where their home was, uh, as well as what facilities they were in. Next slide, please. And this gives an overview of the state and federal facilities in targeted nine states to identify um, those totals. And so this really gave us a starting point in terms of reverse engineering or working backwards to identify. We know where they're at, now let's identify where their, where their homes are. Next slide, please. And this gives us an overview of the percentage of Native Americans in state facilities and targeted states and so by identifying through the federal facilities through the state facilities and through the tribal facilities we we're able to look at those nine targeted states and then do uh, to be able to identify who those children of incarcerated parents were and so we really looked at data in, in our decision making and moving forward in selecting boys and girls clubs throughout Indian country next slide please and so these were the targeted states with the identified state facilities as well as federal facilities uh, that we sent a, we hired a prison liaison uh, for Ameri to work with our American Indian population and we identified them and then tracked them back to the home communities and those became our home uh, community target sites. Next slide please. And so uh, the the, the, the basis uh, of the, the foundation of our grant actually looked at this data. It established a need for us identifying what the facts were and what the challenges were. And so AI is acronym for American Indians. American Indians are twice as likely as other U.S. citizens to become victim of violence. Uh, more than half of violent crimes committed against all American Indian occurred among those aged 12 to 24. The proportion of American Indian families maintained by female reached 27% in 1990, considerably larger than the national figure. Nationwide, 1.2 million latchkey children go home to a house in which there is no parent and where there is an unsecured gun. According to the 2000 census, only 5.5 of American, Indian, and Natives are age 65 and over. And so we pose the question, where will the elders be in the future to provide much needed guidance for the youth? About 12.8 about million children under the age of 18 live in poverty. The 2006 national poverty rate is 12.3%. Uh, of those numbers, 20% of American Indians were living below the poverty level. Um, and then out of those numbers, 51% of those residing on Indian reservations were living in the poverty level. 38% um, of American Indian ages 6 to 11 years live below the poverty line. The percentage of eight is 18% for all children in this group and according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics state, federal, local and tribal authorities were supervising 54,915 American Indians at mid-year in 2004. Of this population 31,738 were under community supervision and 11,485 were held in state prisons. Jails in Indian country held 1,745 inmates, 2,447 inmates held in federal prisons. And so again, our target was very specific. Next slide, please. And so the lessons that we identified for the most part was to gain approval. The first would be to gain approval from the tribal council and the tribal elders at the inception of the mentoring program. And this did two things. It, it one would be asking for permission and two, uh, gaining them as advocates for the program and moving forward um, and developing that network within, the, within each of the respective tribes. Lesson two, providing the mentoring experience on site at the Boys and Girls Clubs ensured maximum protection for youth at the clubs given that it was a site-based uh, program. Next slide. Three, a designated Designated staff person at each club is critical to the life and success of the program. An appropriate selection process to hire staff must be a priority. And so we wanted to make sure that knowing that Boys and Girls Clubs, for the most part, they're doing so much already that we needed to include in the budget someone that would be working, um, a point person that would be collecting all the data, be responsible for all the reporting requirements, et cetera, rather than just signing the duty to someone that's already working there. Lesson four was succession planning as part of every 
Faculty Mentoring Program. And this part played part to the organiza organization of organizing the files, making sure that there was one, whether it be an electronic file or in a binder, that all of the information, all the reporting requirements and so forth would be kept just in case there was any turnover. Next slide. Um, lesson five, planning for program sustainability should begin at the start of the funding cycle as the cycle is not coming to um, not as the cycle is coming to a close and so at the onset of each of these programs um, the Boys and Girls Clubs knew that there's a possibility that beyond the three years we wouldn't get refunded and so they were all able to start working on um, their plans to sustain the programs many um, I believe I believe all but one was successful in 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 growing the program and having it continue beyond the initial three years and then those were, were selected to continue beyond six years. Uh, marketing for the program is ongoing 365 days a year. Educating the population about the benefits of mentoring um, was key and part of that included um, marketing from the very beginning. What we did is we sent announcements, um, press releases of the prestigious award and we also continued marketing it by um, a continuous process of publicizing and marketing the efforts of the good work and the benefits that the communities were receiving as a result of the program. Next slide. Um, lesson seven, exploring a wide range of possible organizations and groups from which to recruit mentors for the program and this effort um, because it was a targeted population, um, it really came down to the local boys and girls clubs who knew their communities the best. And so clubs successfully and typically recruited from the ranks of tribal council, elders, tribal employees, housing agencies, spiritual leaders, colleagues, counselors, and the list just goes on and on. But for the most part, those community organizations served as our network in getting the word out and identifying children as well as the mentors in the program. Uh, lesson eight looks at youth recruited for the mentoring program should receive free membership to the Boys and Girls Clubs. And so the kids that were recruited here, their fees were waived to become Boys and Girls Club members in addition to additional fees for summer camp activities, sports camps, and so forth. And so they, they for the most part, they were welcome to the club. Lesson nine, selecting youth um, with an incarcerated parent is a challenging process. Um, part of this, um, in, the, in the early in the first year of programming, it, it became apparent that multiple factors prevented staff from identifying eligible youth. This was attributed to unwillingness on the part of many individuals who work with youth to reveal which potential mentees had a parent in prison. And so with re the respect for autonomy and confidentiality, um, we understood that this was going to be a difficult process, um, but through, uh, in a confidential um, manner, working with the professionals that we did, the staff were able to secure names of the youth um, in a variety of successful ways. And so these included working um, in the prisons to notify parents about the program. Next would be asking school guidance counselors, social workers to notify families about the program. Um, another was club staff who worked with youth for years knew which kids would qualify for the program. And the fourth was court records help identify parents. And the fifth was word of mouth. The, the beauty of this program was many of the Boys and Girls Clubs didn't have mentoring programs, formal mentoring programs established yet. And so many just opened up mentoring programs, general mentoring programs, and reported those numbers for the kids that were eligible for this program for our purposes. Next slide, please. And so lesson 11, um, it, program coordinators do not have all the answers and um, uh, oftentimes it, it, takes a, it, it, it takes time to realize that this is a process in terms of identifying um, uh, the mentors, the mentees, the impact uh, and, and how we can support developing those quality long-lasting relationships. And so it was a process but we did have um, access to um, uh, with and among the clubs is essential. And so each of our 
partnering boys and girls clubs had access to each other in the field as well as our technical assistance. Um, we had contracted work to Dr. Susan Weinberger um, who had helped us formalize a mentoring program. Um, it's funny how we identified her because she's considered the mentoring guru. We were watching the Today Show one day and one of our colleagues had identified her. We called her up and we got her on a contract to help us formalize this as well. Next lesson. Next slide. And so um, there's one aspect that I wanted to cover, including that it, one lesson that for whatever reason didn't show up, and that, that involves including customs, traditions, and language uh, among activities that include mentors. And uh, so if I could summarize my presentation by saying there is a suggested difference between Western and Native American viewpoints on mentoring. The Western model of mentoring looks at diagnostic testing, while the Native American mentoring is listening for understanding. Um, Western mentoring focuses on outcomes. Native American mentoring focuses on the journey. Western mentoring focuses on the experts. Native American mentoring focuses on inner wisdom. And Western mentoring focuses on action. Native American mentoring reflect, uh, focuses on reflection. And the source for that is CAR 2006. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll make sure that we get the uh, updated slides when we send things out there. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Yazi Lamont had a really good uh, depiction of Western and Native American mentoring, so we apologize for that uh, mishap there. Um, at this time, what we'd like to do, uh, given the fact that we have uh, Dr. Yazi on the call here, we'd like to entertain some questions and answers, and perhaps uh, there may be some questions that were, uh, were not asked earlier. So, Jennifer, I'll turn it back over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, first one, Lamont, you said marketing the program is really an ongoing effort throughout the year to recruit mentors and mentees. Do you find there's any particular messaging or strategies that work best when expressing the benefits of mentoring? And what messaging have you found really resonates with folks? I think for us, um, it was just the different events that were held throughout the life of the project, testimonies from mentors and mentees, Printed flyers and materials, special events, and other marketing techniques were employed, and the marketing led successfully to uh, mentor recruitment also. And so each year in January, the clubs use the National Native American or National Mentoring Month as a tool to gain visibility for their uh, program. And many clubs plan creative ways to get the message out on the importance of mentoring and celebrating their successful programs. Great, thank you. And uh, we have one more question here. You said it's best to explore a wide range of possible organizations and groups from which to recruit mentors. Can you describe what types of organizations and groups have worked really well for you? Um, it varied by community. Of course, you had some that were uh, that were em employed at every within every community, such as your tribal council, your elders, your tribal employees, housing agencies, um, your spiritual leaders, your colleges, counselors, student athletes, your school district, law enforcement. And so they, they vary. One example that I can give is one of the mentoring sites at the Boys and Girls Clubs, um, a majority of the, uh, uh, of the target population that was recruited were all boys. And so the preference was they wanted a male mentor and so um, that the staff at that club had a difficult time recruiting. And so one day, one of the friends that were, was a, worked at the fire department found out about this. And they recruited the whole fire department, and they were all male. And so the fire department became one of the biggest um, volunteer groups at that Boys and Girls Club. That's great. Brian, do we have time for one more question? Great. So I think we have a lot of programs on the line who serve Native American youth, but perhaps not solely Native American youth. Do you or Carla perhaps have any tips for mentoring Native American youth who are part of a larger group and not necessarily um, solely comprise the entire program? Lamont or Rose, did you want to answer that or did you want me to? 
Um, you can answer. Okay. Or, I mean, we can all say a piece. So if you repeat the question, you're saying that only a percentage of the um, group of youth that you serve is Native. Was that correct? That's right, Perfect. yep. And so the question was? Do you have any tips for, for, for a mentoring program that has only a section of Native American youth instead of it being the whole program? So I think what the um, person is asking is that do you mentor them differently than the other youth that attend their program? Is that what they're asking? Yeah, I think um, they're sort of asked. Oh, go ahead, Liv. I'm sorry. Yeah, no. Um, if if this person who did ask the question wants to send clarification, we can start, maybe we can save this one for the end. Yeah. Um, and uh, so this. Yeah, I can. Yeah, let me add this. Well, I think the question is, if the Native American youth that are in a larger group, maybe it's predominantly white, or just a larger group of, of folks, you know, how, what type of strategies or um, uh, methods are there things that need to be done to ensure that the, the Native American youth is probably right. either engaged, yeah. Uh, yeah, something to that effect, and they yeah. can clarify. So, yeah. Well, one thing that I would suggest, and I know Lamont may have some great ideas or Rose as well, but one thing that I think is really important is even doing cross-cultural exchanges. So never isolate people or put them in silos and celebrate and share some of the traditions. And it would be really cool even if the mentees that are Native, you know, were able to share back to the overall large group some of their, whether you allow them to um, teach beating or share some of their indigenous foods. I think it's healthy mm -hmm. to um, do cross-cultural exchanges and embrace all differences, all cultures with each other. And I know um, Lamont did focus on different types of mentoring for Native youth versus not in his last slide that wasn't up there. So if you wanted to add to that, Lamont, but I truly believe that we need to embrace all cultures and not really segregate or separate it out, but to exchange those things as well. Lamont, did you want to add to any of that? Sure. And so we encourage um, heritage, language, and cultural activities. But for the most part, um, at, in terms of the beginning of the relationship that was the mentor-mentee relationship, we identified um, actually activities for them that they could do just to kind of break the ice. And then we slowly went into um, having them settle, uh, setting goals for the mentors and the mentees. And what was interesting in terms of the follow-up of, of the qualifying surveys in terms of the quality of the relationships, a majority of the um, mentoring relationships in terms of their longevity came down to the actual goals that they had set on working um, on together. And so, for example, it may have been preparing for college. It may have been preparing uh, to, to, to learn how to dance in a, in, in a certain category of a powwow and so forth, but I think that the number one common denominator or the, the factor and variable that played into the longevity was the fact that goals were in place that way at each mentoring meeting, um, whether it be once or twice or multiple times a week at the Boys and Girls Clubs, that they were able to continually pick up where they left off on those goals they set. One of the things that we have, we have seven clubs um, in Lumbee Land, and three of those clubs are 100% Native, and uh, four of them have um, other races in them. One of the things that we found with our mentoring is in the piece where we um, have a survey and uh, we identify those folks, of course, asking them what parents are able to do, because part of the mentoring piece is getting to know the families of the, these folks. And uh, so we find out uh, surely that some of our parents have skills that can be shared in our clubs. So just as you would have a situation and you would be mentoring non-native kids, you would also be identifying that I think is part of the initial survey. So one of the uh, ways that you could help with uh, mentoring those native kids in the club not only as a mentoring piece, but in other activities, is to involve the parents. Because you, you have right there, you know, information about the parents, what they may or may not uh, be able to do, and reaching out to them to become part of the club activities as a volunteer. 
I think can help strengthen anything that's going on in that club. And you can do that um, the same with any different nationality or whatever that you would have uh, as far as membership in your club. I think it's all about training them that you put those mentors in, teaching them to be sensitive to all kids that are part of your club. Thank you very much. I think that was a pretty good answer from all three of you, and um, we're going to get ready to move on. I just wanted to uh, send a special acknowledgement, a shout out to uh, Jim Antel, uh, Deputy Administrator at OJJP. Thanks a lot, Jim, for being on this call. Uh, why don't we go ahead and move to the next slide, and uh, we've got our uh, our co-presenters there, Josie Rafaelito from the Center for Native American Youth in Great and White. Josie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Brian. Um, yes, A, thank you to um, OJJDP for the invitation to join today's webinar, and thank you to the previous presenters for the incredible work that they do to support our Native youth across the country. Um, so I'm joining today's um, conversation to briefly introduce you to the Center for Native American Youth to describe our leadership development program called Champions for Change, which um, in the context of today, I think really plays in, uh, an important role in peer-to-peer um, -peer mentoring. Um, but I think more importantly, be able to introduce you to an inspiring young leader from the Mohawk tribe who is um, actively engaging in mentoring opportunities, um, both on a national level with our organization, um, but on a local level um, in his community. So um, I'll, I'm going to be as quick as I can so I can turn over uh, the time to Brayden. So if we can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So I work with the Center for Native American Youth. We are a policy program founded in 2011 by former U.S. Senator Byron Dorgan. And our goal is to raise national awareness to the challenges and successes Native American youth face today. So we learn from and work with the 2.1 million American Indian and Alaskan Natives who are under the age of 25. And so at the heart of our work is uh, suicide prevention, but from a public health standpoint, we address issues that intersect with prevention, including education, child welfare, juvenile justice issues, and down to mentoring and much, much more. So we work in partnership with tribal organizations, people in communities, tribal leaders, federal agencies, and new stakeholders um, who want to promote collaboration that helps improve the well-being of young people in Indian country. Um, so our website is listed at the bottom if folks want to visit us and want to learn a little bit more, but we can go ahead and go to the next slide. And the way that we describe our efforts um, is in four different areas of work, youth inspiration, advocacy, policy change, and building a national resource platform. And so for, days, uh, for today's session, we will focus, our programming, um, focus on our programming that seeks to inspire young people and help create a narrative that is driven by Native youth. So the narrative we help communicate on a national level is generated by direct outreach and partnerships with tribal and urban Indian communities. Um, so from more than 150 Native Youth Roundtable meetings across the country, we hear that young people are, are looking for more positive role models. Um, you know, they're looking for mentoring connections and opportunities to promote culture, language, and traditional values. So we want to go to the next slide. And so, you know, with that direct feedback from youth, um, you know, early on in, in our programming, uh, we understood that the need to identify and recognize young, la young Native leaders who are creating positive change in their communities. And so we created um, the Champions for Change program in 2013. Um, and so it focuses on youth ages 14 to 22 um, who are, you know, identifying challenges they see in their communities. and. Um, want to do something about that, whether it's addressing suicide prevention or education or serving as a positive role model and creating a youth council of some sort. And so the program really seeks to elevate the voices of these positive stories of Native youth and create pathways to opportunity to engage you know, policy and decision makers on a, on a national level, um, also down to a state and local level. And you know, really wanting to promote you know, the priorities and issues they see um, impacting their communities, um, which often include leadership development, um, you know, the need to um, identify more more mentors and networking, and so that's been a big part of um, the program. And so, you know, our organization, we manage the application process. You'll see the, 
There will be the deadline is, this year is November 15th, um, and we select five Native youth at the beginning of each year to participate in a series of recognition events here in DC. Um, and they also serve a one-year term on our youth advisory board at the Center for Native American Youth. So we, um, you know, have this great opportunity to meet with and learn from um, these young leaders, but the program really fosters organic peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. You know, we have seen, we now have um, four classes at this point um, from, you know, college or high school level all the way to law school, and they have a chance to meet with each other, learn about different issues that they're working on. Um, and so, you know, we're really um, lucky today to, to have one of our champions from the 2016 class um, who was recognized for his positive efforts in his community. Um, so he's going to, Braden's going to be able to describe um, just briefly about um, his experience in the program, um, his mentoring efforts that are taking place on a local level, and his perspectives, I think, with going to be helpful to the larger discussion and questions that we'll have on the webinar on how to engage new partners um, in mentoring initiatives and um, how to create more meaningful mentoring opportunities in Indian country. So with that said, I'd like to invite uh, Braden White to join the conversation. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, and February 2016, I was honored with the prestigious award of Champion for Change by Center for Native American Youth. I was honored for the work I do in my community with uh, our local coalition and uh, community um, community service events, like uh, such as like I um, I coach hockey and I coach lacrosse in our local community as a volunteer coach. I've been a coach for the local sports teams since 2011, and in that position, I've um, done a lot of mentoring and the importance of giving a child your time has upon them, and that's always been a big thing for me, is they say the most important thing you can give a child is your time. Along with um, my fellow coaches, I've helped incorporate the cultural side of lacrosse into our practices through the teaching of the opening address and what the gift of lacrosse stands for, such as being respectful. I've also had the opportunity to um, serve as a JOM youth counselor in the summers of 2010, 2013, and 2014, which was another great mentoring experience. And we were able to incorporate a lot of cultural events and do a lot of mentoring and be good role models for our youth and our community. I also had the opportunity in 2015 to, to serve as a per diem program assistant with the Akuzosni Boys and Girls Club. During that time, I had a really um, great time. We um, hosted traditional social events and did a lot of culturally relevant activities to help reinforce that cultural identity with the youth in my community. I believe it's important to include cultural aspects into the program because, as previously stated, it helps the, ch um, the children reaffirm their cultural identity and who they are. And it provides them with the knowledge of their cultural language, traditions, and teachings to better understand their heritage. Next slide. While I was on a trip in, to Minnesota, I was able to connect with my fellow champion for change, Vanessa Goodfender, who is from the Lower Sioux Indian community in Minnesota. As we were talking about our culture teaching, she mentioned, she mentioned how in her culture they do an activity with the young girls in which they make cornhusk dolls and how they explain the story behind why the cornhusk doll has no face. They, which, in, which is in that story, the cornhusk doll was always looking at her reflection in the water. So to show that, so on the creator to show that she was equal to everybody else and to teach her to not um, always worry about like looking better than anybody else in that vanity, um, the creator took her face away. But in the teachings, the way Vanessa teaches it, she said it teaches um, when they're making the corn husk dolls, they, um, when they're making the hair for the corn husk dolls and when they're making the clothes for the corn husk dolls, they're teaching like always keep the corn husk dolls hair brushed, always keep her clothes neat. And with that, they, they instill the, 
core set of values for these young girls to always keep a good self-image and build self-esteem, but always also be humble, just like the creator had told the corn husk to always be humble and always be good to everybody else, no matter what they look like. I found this to be a prime example of not just cross-cultural teachings translating to real life, but also the fact that it served as peer-to-peer -peer mentoring because I was able to learn from her community and be able to bring that activity that she implemented in her community back to my community. Next slide. The challenges that I see is um, the West approach is a, and mindset is a challenge, as well as mistrust and the paternalistic approach. And solutions for that would be, such as the paternalistic approach, a solution for that would be to partner with tribal government and organizations to better understand issues and build meaningful relationships, as well as the hiring of Native staff, because with the hiring of Native staff, it helps address and make that connection between the partners and the Native American communities, because the staff understand the needs of the Native youth, as well as the staff can help educate the partners that are they're teaming up with, as well as engaging Native youth, because by engaging Native youth, organizations can hear firsthand the issues that are specifically affecting the youth demographic and how organizations can serve to address the, <laughs> excuse me, organizations can serve to address set issues and work to find solutions. Next slide. All right, well, thank you both. I, I think we've got a few moments for some questions here. Um, so first, we'll, we'll go to Josie. I believe you said you serve youth up to the age of 25. Um, do you find the challenges you encounter and the strategies you use to engage older youth, maybe between the ages of 18 and 25, are similar or different from the younger population? And do you have different programs for different age groups? Yeah, so great question. So, you know, the way that our, our programming works, we are very quick on our feet and know that we have to adjust to not just the, the different age ranges that either participate in a roundtable session or in our Champions for Change program, but it's also, you know, it, um, shifting and making adjustments when we're visiting different communities. So what we really focus on in, in our work is to, you know, make sure that we're listening to what the young people's needs are, what their strengths are, and how they want to see um, the program developed around what's going to make them most successful. And, you know, with our, our Champions for Change program, um, it, it is only, you know, four years old, um, and we were very honest with our, our first um, class and, of course, moving forward that, you know, this is a program that, you know, can be molded by each class and what they want to get out of it and what they want to focus on. And so, when we're doing, you know, um, direct work with a, a one of our younger champions, it's, you know, really ask, figuring out what their needs are and looping in their parents, which I think has been really helpful for us, um, and making sure that we're over communicating um, with everyone to to make sure that we know um, what they need to either prepare for a speaking engagement or a presentation at their school or whatever that you know they're whatever they're looking for, some extra support on. So we definitely have to make those adjustments. Um, but it also, I think, what we found, um, and again, I, I say organically, because we um, didn't want to force a, you know, a, a pairing, mentoring um, setup between our classes, and just saw that, you know, our young people were, um, you know, jumping into these conversations and looking to um, the college-age students and looking to those that are looking at grad school and, and law school to learn from them and to ask them questions. And I think that's been the, some of the beauty that has come out of, um, you know, the past four years of this program. And we're, you know, learning from other mentoring programs, other, other initiatives, but making sure, sure that we're learning from our cohorts and what they need. Um, and I guess for our, 
our programming specific to the age. Um, our Champions for Change program is for youth 14 to, to 24, um, but for the, the younger students, we absolutely invite them to, to be involved. Um, with CNAY, we, we're also a partner with the Generation Indigenous Movement, um, where we're encouraging young people to take the Gen I Challenge. Um, so folks can connect with me afterwards or ask more questions about that. But that's a, a an opportunity for youth as young as they want to, as young as they are, to to engage, to sign up, and be part of this national movement to to you know inspire other young leaders across Indian country and and make sure that um, you know it's a we're creating a positive narrative about our communities. Great, thank you. And next, Brayden, can you tell us a little bit more about what motivated you to be part of Champions for Change? What motivated me to be um, part of Champions for Change is I, I have a really strong, um, like I want to make a difference in my community and I want to make a difference with our youth. I want to give our youth an avenue of um, hope. I want to be able to show them that these things are possible. And it all... Um, like one of the big things that in my community that I showed the youth was was I had the opportunity to be serve as a presidential youth panelist at the 2015 White House Tribal Nations Conference in November, and I was able to sit on sit on the stage with President Barack Obama, and I was able to talk about um, some of the struggles and comment on some of the struggles that are facing our Native youth, and to discuss the, these issues and ask him like what solutions would can we um have moving forward so that we can resolve these issues and they'll no longer be present. So by doing that I was I was expressing the youth's voice but I was also showing the youth like what's possible if you um work towards it and you um go out there and step outside that comfort zone. But like um there's been a lot of issues that I take a lot of a strong stance on such as suicide prevention. I lost my close friend in 2012 to suicide and I've been working really hard since then to um, try and prevent it in the Native American communities and beyond into um, off-reservation communities as well to try and get to the bottom of it and try and serve as a outlet if these if the youth and um, people are in crisis. And through that, I've um, been able to get mental health first aid training. I've been able to do my safe talk training. And in the coming months, I'm doing my assist training so I can actually host training so I can train other community members to be trainers as well. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing, Brayden, and thanks for everything you do. Uh, the next question, I think we have time for one or two more. Um, for Lamont and or Josie, do either of your programs serve youth in the juvenile justice system? And if so, can you share any experiences or strategies to enhance services for youth in the juvenile justice system? Um, so our program didn't get continuation funding. Um, for mentoring children of prisoners in, beyond 2010. And so since then, I've been working for the uh, Navajo Nation Department of Diné Education. And so I'm no longer working with um, the mentoring programs. But I do know that many of the uh, mentoring programs have continued since uh, in partnership with Boys and Girls Clubs and other tribal youth programs. And this is Josie, I can chime in too. Um, with our programming, we do our best um, to be inclusive when we're visiting communities and promoting some of these youth engagement opportunities like Champions for Change. And so, you know, we rely heavily on the community programs and partners that we've connected with and, you know, the extension of those as well. Um, and, you know, invite young people who, you know, aren't, you know, um, on the honor roll or aren't maybe college bound at this point and so really trying to make sure that you know folks who um, are looking for that that opportunity to share their perspective whether it's through 
um, a, a young person that has had experience with the juvenile justice system or the child welfare system, um, we want to hear from those young leaders too and make sure that their voice is at the table. Um, we've had some you know, incredible opportunities in partnership with the Casey Family Programs um, to identify young, young people who have um, experienced the, um, the child welfare system and foster care system and share their perspectives on a national level. And so we're always looking for those types of, um, you know, viewpoints and, again, opportunities. So we want to be inclusive and work with folks that have been um, either experienced or still in the juvenile, juvenile justice system and would be happy to work with anyone who's on the phone that has a young person in mind who wants to, um, you know, step up, share their perspective, um, share what they're maybe doing within their, their networks. Um, to have conversations about how to create change and what's needed to, to make that happen both on a systemic level but maybe programming that they see um, being that's taking action in, in, the, um, in the system. So um, great question. We want to. We're open to it absolutely um, and always learning so, so please reach out. All right. Thank you. Well, thanks to everyone who asked a question and thank you to all the panelists. I'll turn things back over to Brian to wrap up. Thanks. Do we have any final questions? I don't have a problem going over a minute or so. Uh, was there every question that you thought could be answered could be answered now? Or? I believe so. Yeah, we, we were just getting a lot of comments um, to thank the panelists and, and saying, um, especially thank you to, to Brayden for, for everything you've been doing. Fantastic. Thank you for having me. So I want to thank everyone again for that's on the panel, um, uh, Carla Knapp and her experience, and uh, Dr. Rosemary Lowry Townsend, uh, Dr. Lamont Yazi, uh, Josie Rapalito, and of course Braden White, uh, who gives us that youth perspective. Uh, this has been a very informative and educational um, uh, presentation to all of us. Uh, we also want to uh, alert you to the fact that we'll be sending out a survey right after the webinar. Uh, we have a couple of resources that you might find to be very helpful. Uh, uh, Lamont mentioned uh, Susan Weinberger, who uh, created a uh, handbook, um, and you can see that information uh, below uh, from the Mentoring Consulting Group. And then the Kinship Mentoring Model, uh, Seventh Generation, which you heard Rose Marie talk a little bit about uh, earlier. So again, we want to thank everyone who attended, uh, all of our OJJDP grantees, and uh, we wish you all very well. Uh, we will be having a another uh, grantee webinar probably in September, October on mentoring Native, uh, excuse me, uh, Latino and Hispanic American youth as well. Um, so on behalf of Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership and the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, uh, we appreciate all of you and we thank you all. And our panelists, thanks again. Uh, we appreciate the work that you put in and we will certainly be in touch and you all will receive the materials uh, in the next coming next several weeks. Thank you all. Have a great day.